Thank you for coming uh, today to this lecture. The quest for knowledge and human perfection is one of the most stimulating characteristics of classical Muslim scholarship. It has found its literary expression in a remarkable and quite diverse body of medieval Arabic writings on philosophy, theology, history, mysticism, and the natural sciences. In this literature on Muslim learning and education, one book stands out for its particularly imaginative approach and its powerful language. It is the allegorical philosophical novel Hay ibn Yaqsan, or Living Son of Wakeful, as the Arabic title of this book reads in English. This book was written in Islamic Spain by the distinguished 12th century Muslim philosopher and physician Ibn Tufayl. It is a narrative that tells the intriguing story of a boy who grows up on a remote island somewhere in the Indian Ocean alone and without contact to human civilization, and who finds God solely through autodidactic learning and mystical contemplation. The author, Ibn Tufayl, was born in a town near Granada, the capital of a southern province in Andalus, Islamic Spain. Ibn Tufayl studied medicine and several natural sciences in Sevilla and Cordoba, two intellectual strongholds on the Iberian Peninsula at that time. He eventually settled in Granada as a physician. The Iberian Peninsula and large parts of the Maghreb the Islamic West were dominated in those days by the al a Muslim dynasty promoting a strict form of belief in the oneness and uniqueness of God. Quite in contrast to their state policy towards religion, the al muhad ruler in Ibn Tufayl's time, Caliph Abu Yusuf, was an enlightened sovereign with a deep interest in Greek philosophy. He made Ibn Tufayl his court physician and advisor in the Moroccan city of Marrakesh, where Ibn Tufayl became influential Ibn Tufayl died in Morocco in 1185. The only surviving book of Ibn Tufayl's scholarly oeuvre is his philosophical allegorical novel, Haid ibn Yaqsan, Living Son of Death, entitled After the Name of the Novel's Protagonist. In Arabic, the book title evokes a number of images and thoughts. First, while the Arabic word hay means a living being as an individual, it also is a collective noun that refers to the core point and life source of a tribe or clan. It thus designates life as such and is a synonym, synonym for humanity in general. Second, Ibn Yaqsan, son of Wakeful, recalls the Quranic idea of God, the ever watchful, that is, the form of divine existence which knows neither sleep nor inattentiveness. If seen from this perspective, Son of Wakeful stands for all humankind as a product of God's creation. The subtitle of Ibn Tufayl's book on the secrets of Oriental wisdom alludes to the long tradition of Oriental epistemologies, which are sometimes associated with the Latin expression ex oriental lux, light or wisdom comes from the East, while light, as a metaphor 
for divine wisdom was significant to several influential Muslim scholars prior and after Ibn Tufayl. But the reference of, to Oriental wisdom is also a more specific reference, as we will see in a minute. Let us now turn to the story of this masterpiece of classical Arabic writing. The protagonist, Haid bin Yaqsan, is a boy who grows up alone on a tropical island. He embodies a sort of prototype Robinson Crusoe to the extent that he is utterly self-reliant and far removed from other human beings and civilization. This is not to imply, however, that Ibn Tufayl's book is just a tale of great adventures. On the contrary, Ibn Tufayl's Haid ibn Yaqsan is the story of someone who persistently strives to acquire knowledge and to grow. In fact, without the aid of divine revelation or prophecy, but relying instead only on his acute intellectual powers of observation and on mystical contemplation, in a gradual process of cognition, Hai in Yapsan finally finds God. It is noteworthy that Hai's intellectual abstraction is not rooted in any human language. Hai did not know how to speak as we read in the novel. Rather, he learned a human language only as an adult. After he met a visitor, from a neighboring atom. The author, Peter Feil, introduces his story of living son of wakeful with a theoretical preface. Here, he sets out the academic framework of his novel and tells the reader that an unidentified friend had asked him to unfold the secrets of the Oriental wisdom in Arabic and as exposed by the prince of philosophers, Ibn Sina, or Abyssinia, as he is known in the West. These studies of Ibn Sina's philosophy, as Ibn Dufay makes it clear, set off a stream of ideas in the author, lifting him to a state of sublimity he had never known before. This ecstatic state was so full of joy, delight and bliss that the tongue cannot describe it. Yet, Ibn Dufayl tells us also that only those whose minds have been prepared and sharpened by intellectual pursuits are capable of sustaining such light-headedness and sweepingly abstract insight without speaking unwisely and acting foolish. In other words, individual joy and happiness may become possible in this world if the quest for intellectual philosophical knowledge is combined with and enhanced by spiritual contemplation and mystical practice, as the author describes it based on his own educational journey and experience. In the preface to the book, Ibn Tufayl explicitly names a number of Muslim scholars whose philosophical and mystical views he studied. He mentions philosophers such as Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, and Ibn Bajr, as well as Al-Ghazali, probably the most important Islamic theologian and mystic of the day. Ibn Tufayl highlights in this regard that Al-Ghazali and Ibn Sina were the two most important scholars for his own educational formation. He acknowledges this point by confirming that he would not have attained the truth culmination of his intellectual and spiritual efforts, both from the author's preface, 
without pursuing the argument of Al-Azali and Ibn Sina, checking them one against the other, and comparing the results with the views that have sprung up in Morocco and Islamic Spain. The file also states, I continued this intellectual journey until, finally, I was able to see the truth for myself. First, by thought and theory, and now in my first brief taste of the actual mystical experience. And the famous physician and philosopher Ibn Sina was of special importance to the identifier in this regard, as Ibn Sina wrote a trilogy of mystical tales of which the first is anti-Ibn living son of God. Whereas the contents and the plots of Ibn Sina's and Ibn Tufayl's <coughs> narratives significantly differ, these accounts have in common that they both stress the active or to didactic aspect of learning and healing them. After this theoretical introduction, Ibn Tufayl then relates the unusual circumstances of the birth of his literary figure, the reader's attention is quickly engrossed as two different versions of high birth are related. The first story relates that the sister of a tyrannical king bore the son as the fruit of a forbidden love affair with Yatsan, a man from the neighboring king. Fearing the rage of her brother and king, the princess entrusted the fate of the newborn to God and put the sucking babe out into the sea in a sealed box. The box with the infant eventually washed up on a deserted island, a literary motif alluding to the biblical and the Quranic story of the baby Moses. The second story, however, has a more fantastic version of Heisenberg to tell. It claims that there were no other humans involved in Heisenberg. According to this account, it all began when a bit of clay started to ferment, heat joined with cold, and damp with brines. These natural processes caused bubbles to form in the clay. A space was created for the soul which, he wrote, emanates continuously from God and glory to him. Out of these compounds of fermenting clay and God-sent soul, high human being came into existence. The clay from the blood clot, which became an embryo that grew to be a person just as described in the Quranic account of the origin of God. This particular image of birth also parallels the idea of Adam in the Bible, the first human who came to life with neither parents nor cuts. The two stories of High's birth lead to a single continuation of the tale. The main part of the novel then describes the highest life and learning in a series of seven stages, each seven years in length. <clears throat> At the first stage, a gazelle finds the tree high. The gazelle suckles him, cares for him, and raises him as her own offspring. Living with the gazelle, Hai learns to survive in the wilderness. He becomes acquainted with basic feelings, such as affection and warmth, but also with shame, unhappiness, and sorrow. By the age of seven, he becomes aware that he is not an animal, or at least that he is quite different from other animals. 
During the second and third stages up to age 21, Hyde realizes that unlike the animals, he is naked and defenseless. He begins covering himself in leaves and feathers and learns to make use of his physical advantages, like the ability to walk upright. I also starts to make conscious use of his mind. Through observation and experimentation, he considerably increases his knowledge of the world he lives in. When the gazelle, his beloved mother, dies, he is filled with pain and grief. He decides to cut the gazelle open to try and find out why she has stopped moving. After examining several organs, he finds the creature's heart, which, he assumes, is where life is located. He opens the heart and finds that one of the chambers is filled with blood and the other is empty. He concludes that the vital force of his mother, the gazelle, must have resided within this now empty channel. For high this explains the gazelle's death. He recognizes that the dead body is but an empty hulk, worth nothing without that breath that had previously animated it. Hence, his feelings of love for his mother are no longer fixed on the lifeless body, but only on the being which had departed from the heart, that is, his soul, which also in the Islamic tradition outlives death. In the fourth period, up to age 28, Hai becomes acquainted with the laws of the sensible world. He observes the sky and deems the heavenly bodies to be made of light. He concludes that these heavenly bodies must have been created from an even stronger light, and that this source of light may well be the origin of all things. From this point on, Hai begins to differentiate individuals, type, material objects by form, and effects by effects. In the fifth phase of his life, Hai develops his epistemological capabilities. These contemplations on the structure of the cosmos bring him to fundamental metaphysical questions. They lead him to the insight that the entire universe must have an omnipotent creator. The sixth and seventh phase describe Hai's ultimate religious awakening. Through contemplation and meditation, Hai develops the awareness that there are separate forms beyond those in his immediate environment, and that events in this life have a connection with another world. He debates with himself about these ideas and determines that everything must have been created and animated by a high divine force. Hai finally is able to lay aside all worldly activities and dedicate himself exclusively to God. Two things are remarkable. First, according to current medical research, there is indeed a seven-year cycle of the human body in which the body replaces itself with a large new set of cells. This is interesting in view of Ibn Tufayl's assignment of seven seven-year cycles to his protagonist's development. And second, there is a pattern of seven, or more precisely, seven plus one more stage stage 8, to be detected in Ibn Tufayl's novel. This pattern has several parallels in the Islamic and in non-Islamic religious traditions. 
from the Bible, you may recall the establishment of these the seven days of the week. For example, as God spends six days creating the heavens and the earth, and then rests on the seventh day. This account has made biblical scholarship to identify the number seven as something he has finished or complete. In the Islamic context, the Quran also refers to the number seven more than once. There is mention of seven heavens, the seven levels of paradise, mirrored by the seven levels of heaven. Accordingly, on his famous night journey from Jerusalem to heaven, the Prophet Muhammad ascends in a single night to the seven heavens, greeted at each heaven by a different light. But only above the seventh heaven where the throne of God is located, the Prophet Muhammad is privileged to encounter divine presence and actually speak to God. In Ibn Tufayl's story, the ultimate stage of highest development at the age of 50 represents this peak of intellectual and spiritual development. The author tells his readers that the protagonist Haim, quote, now perceives what no eye has seen or ear has heard before, nor has it entered into the heart of man to conceive. In the original Arabic text, this sentence is presented as a saying of the Prophet Muhammad. It is striking, though, that these words are identical to a passage in the first epistle of Paul, the Apostle, to the Corinthians. In that letter, Paul imparts the knowledge of God's mysterious truth and wisdom to the Corinthians. However, it is, as is stated in the Bible, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world. For Ibn Tufayl, these words offer insight into God's plan, hidden from ordinary humans so far. A plan God had devised long before he created the world, and with which, with which he lets humankind now share in his help. Overwhelmed by this experience of the divine, how now chooses to dedicate himself entirely to the contemplation of God and never leave this state of beatitude. Once the protagonist achieved the state of contentment, most readers might expect that the story has come to its conclusion. Yet, perfectly in line with the Arabic narrative technique of stories within stories, Ibn Tufayl follows up the tale with an echo. He reports here that Hai has come into contact with other people and civilization and relates that one day a man named Absal returned from the neighboring capital to Hai's Hai. Absal was at odds with his friend, Salaman over a number of fundamental religious questions. While Absal believed that there must be some deeper meaning in religion, something more than what he had come, encountered and come to know through the formalized practice of faith, Salaman, by contrast, was satisfied with the manifest contents and conditions of religion. When Absal encounters Hai on this island, he teaches him human language, thus enabling the two men to communicate verbally and exchange their ideas on philosophical issues. Hai soon learns that he is in agreement with Absal on the important questions that have occupied him for such a long time. These concern primarily the belief in the existence of an 
omnipotent creator and in the intellectual capacity of the human being to discern the structure of the world and of the universe, as well as the place and destiny of humans within this process, within this system. However, where Hayek had arrived at pure truth through intellectual learning and inner reflection, Absal and the people on the neighboring island come to very similar insights with the help of a prophet and the revelations he had shared with them. Absal and Hayek now travel together to the neighboring island on which Salaman has since become king. When Hai meets Salaman and the people of the, in this kingdom, Hai explains to them some of his profound wisdom and comprehensive awareness of God. Yet, the majority of the people are not receptive to the complex imagery in Hai's view of faith. Eventually, Hai abandons the hope of changing the people and returns with Absal to his island where they would spend the rest of the days in mystical contemplation. At the end of the novel, the author, Ibn Tufayl, addresses the reader directly. Somewhat like the Apostle Paul in the Bible, Ibn Tufayl notes that his story belongs to a hidden branch of study, which will be pressed only by those who have a real understanding of God. With his book, the author says, he has lifted the veil that had hidden his knowledge. He has done so, to find rights, because wrong opinions and corruption had gained the upper hand in society. And many weak people rejected the authority of the prophet and followed the ways of fools instead. Therefore, he concludes, it was necessary to draw the people away from the false ways of life and belief and encourage them to see their true meaning. Ibn Tufai remarks also that he hopes his treatise will excite desire in the audience to take themselves on an intellectual journey so that they too will strive towards the secret and achieve knowledge of God. But he says as well, quote, nonetheless, I have not left the secrets set down in these few pages entirely without a way, a shield easily pierced by those fit to do so capable of growing so thick to those unworthy of passing beyond that they will never reach it. Of course, the idea of an autodidactic rational way of religious learning eventually leading to belief in and vision of God was not entirely new in our literature and so on. I relied in this respect especially on the concept advanced by Ibn Sina, Arisiana, the already mentioned physician and philosopher. Ibn Sina had written a trilogy of mystical tales, of which the first is entitled Hai in Yaksan. Whereas the contents and the plots of Ibn Sina's identified narrative significantly differ, they do have in common that they both express active autodidactic aspect of the world and Among the Muslim recipients of the beautiful work, particular mention deserve Ibn Rush Amaros, the well-known Spanish Arab philosopher, as well as the Spanish Jewish scholar Moses Ben Joshua of Nagor. Both scholars wrote commentaries on the beautiful work in Arabic and the latter in Hebrew.
Since Ibn Tufayl's novel was translated at an early time into Latin and other European languages, it became a source of great fascination for scholars in Europe. Among those are the German scholar Gottfried Ephraim Lessing, who acquainted himself with Ibn Tufayl's basic thesis through the Latin translation of the novel. The 18th century English writer Daniel Defoe, in turn, was inspired most likely by an English translation of Ibn Tufayl's book, who writing his famous adventure book, Robinson Crusoe. Finally, The Life of Pi, published in 2001 by the French Canadian writer Jan Martel, has striking parallels to Ibn Tufayl's novel. As in Mortel's book, a boy from India recognizes the spiritual and ethical values of the three religions he explores Hinduism, Christianity, and Islam, which leads him to embrace all three of these religions. Let me conclude. First, Ibn Tufayl's highly imaginative coming-of-age story offers an intellect-oriented pathway to knowledge that contrasts the tradition-centered pursuit of learning predominant in, uh, at his time in Islamic Spain and the Islamic West. For Ibn Tufay, humans may, in an almost humanistic manner, discover what best promotes human flourishing and find fulfillment and happiness through active use of learning techniques like inquiry, deduction, and analysis, combined with mystical contemplation and spiritual growth. Particularly noteworthy in this regard is the idea that in Ibn Tufayl's view, the human being can achieve these goals without prophets, the prophets, revealed scriptures, and an established religion in the conventional sense. Also, Ibn Tufayl's concept of human life and existence centers on the innate human ability and inclination to learn, grow, and prosper, as much as it does on an individual direct relationship with the Creator. Consequently, the protagonist Hai finds his way to God without being or becoming a Muslim, a Christian, or a Jew. It is therefore not surprising that Ibn Tufayl's tale was of special interest to later rationalist Muslim thinkers like the already mentioned Spanish Arab philosopher Ben Rush and the Spanish Jewish scholar Moses Ben Jashwarov. Likewise, the early translations of the tale into Latin and many other European languages also found their receptive readers. You mentioned the German Enlightenment scholar Messing, author of Nathan the Wise, and the English writer Daniel Defoe, famous for his novel Robinson Crusoe. Second, Ibn Tufayl voices uncompromising critique of Muslim society of his own time. He rejects an understanding of Islam that reduces life and faith to human-made doctrines and conventions of worship. Ibn Tufayl profoundly disagrees with proponents of a tradition-oriented Islam like the authoritative 11th century scholar Al-Azali, who argued that Aristotelian philosophy was a threat to Muslim piety and to salvation in the next world, and that mystical experience must be grounded in Orthodox Muslim faith. By contrast, Ibn, Ibn Tufayl, there is no contradiction between rational philosophical thought on the one hand and true faith in God and human happiness in this world on the other. Although the latter may be achieved only by those capable of such evil insight. 
And last, but by no means least, Ibn Tufail's book is a model of education that has no educator in the conventional sense of the word. Our author thus emphasizes again the power and the sovereignty of the human intellect and the fact that for him, God alone is the principal and supreme teacher of humankind.